I worked on uh, fun stuff like a clip art website until I got fed up with IE problems and decided I'd come to the IE team to fix them. So I worked on IE7, I worked on networking, and I worked on a couple of trust-related features like SSL and so forth. Uh, my spare time, I've done a couple of things related to IE. I don't know if anybody's heard of uh, Tamper IE or Fiddler. Uh, these are fairly popular add-ons for Internet Explorer, for penetration testing, and for performance, and for other, other tasks. Uh, as I mentioned previously, I'm a program manager for security uh, for IE, and uh, as, as a result, I get to hear all kinds of jokes about it. Uh, so now you can fill out your mythical creatures checklist and say that you have actually seen Internet Explorer Security PM in the wild. So, IE 8, version 8, are we done yet? You know, there's not all that many products out there that are in their eighth version and, you know, still coming to conferences and talking about what's new and what, what's going on and, you know, version eight, man, I'm tired. I don't know if you guys are tired. Are we done? And, you know, it's kind of interesting because as we were in the planning process for Internet Explorer 7, uh, we figured, you know, we were behind. We had a lot to do. We had a lot of catch up. We did a lot of work. But, you know, we finished. We came out of IE 7. We had a big plan. We did a lot of work. And as we went to plan IE8, it was kind of like, well, why is this so hard? You know, why aren't we done yet? And, you know, what's hard about browser security? And it turns out browser security is hard for a bunch of different reasons. But one of the reasons, basically, is just the, simpl the simple complexity of the web browser system. The way that things plug into one another, the way that emergent behaviors arise when you put together things like extensions, uh, arbitrary content coming off the web, all the different types of file parsers, HTML parsers, mobile code like JavaScript and, and extension languages. All this stuff combined together makes for an extremely complicated system where if you try and change any one thing, you're liable to break the entire system. And so complexity is one of the big, big challenges for the Internet Explorer team, not just for security, but also for making the, the functionality of the browser and the platform make sense. So looking at IE8, I actually joined the security team uh, for IE8 roughly uh, about a year and a half ago, just doing security instead of my old focus. And one of the big questions was, is there a shortcut? Is there something just blindingly obvious that we're missing? You know, maybe there's a way out of this problem. And so, you know, we took, we took a look and, and we took a naive look and we said, hey, wait, we could block nearly 100% of exploits by just removing one of the components from the Internet Explorer system. You know, it would be great, it would be fantastic. People wouldn't worry about IE vulnerabilities anymore. Turns out it's kind of an important component in the system, and when you get rid of it, the browser's not really very interesting anymore. So that's not the simple solution. You know, taking, unplugging the network cable, effective, but it's really never going to fly in the real world. So we take a look, okay, what else can we do? Is there something else that we can do? Some part of the system that we can shore up? Is there another part we can get rid of? Reduce the tax surface? Yeah, get rid of the user. Get rid of the user, a lot of the problems, social engineering just completely goes away. And, you know, that's nice, but frankly, we not really have any users anymore, so that wouldn't be desirable. Then the last thing we could do is just redesign everything. And this is one of the things that's come to the forefront lately because there's lots of smart people that have started to look at the browser security problem and browser problems in general, and they say, I can do better. All we have to do is replace HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and get everybody to upgrade, and then we're good. You know, unplug the internet, do some upgrades, plug it all back in, and everything's better. You know, we'll put up some security, put lots of different locks, and, you know, the user experience will never be the same, and you have to type a pin anytime you go to a website, but, you know, you're going to be safe. And, of course, these types of things, not very common either. And so, basically, if we get rid of the users, get rid of the network, or redesign everything, then, then we're good to go, and we can go home. Well, all of these things just aren't going to fly. People won't, you know, they won't upgrade. They won't use the new version of the browser if we break everything or introduce major constraints that aren't there previously. And so we have to find a way to balance. And balance is going to be a key part of this talk because it turns out that security is easy. Balance is hard. The reason security is easy is because you can make any number of changes and dramatically reduce the attack surface of the browser, dramatically remove vulnerabilities, just make major changes. But if you do these in a way where people don't like the browser, where people don't use the browser, where the people don't upgrade the browser, then we haven't done anything at all. And Jeremiah Grossman this morning kind of set me up with this. Uh, he said that you know, there's, a, there's a conflict, a conflict of browsers, basically. They want market share. Well, Internet Explorer still has a, a pretty significant amount of market share. 
And our concern isn't about getting market share, right? We don't want to go steal Firefox's market share. What we want to steal is IE6's market share. There's a lot of people that didn't see the need to upgrade from IE6 to IE7. Why could that be? We worked really hard on it. We had tons of people working hard for years to build a browser. We released it. Many people eagerly upgraded, but for a sizable number of customers, they looked at it and said, yeah, why would they do that? And one of the primary reasons they would do that is compatibility. IE7 made some changes that impacted compatibility. Frankly, these changes were relatively minor compared to the stuff we've done in IE8. But they looked at it and they said, hey, wait, my website doesn't quite work right anymore. Maybe if I just ignore this, this IE7 thing will go away. Because that's what they'd gotten used to. The IE team not releasing browsers and old versions of the site work forever. Well, problem is you can only do that for so long before, you know, basically the web collapses under its own weight. Things are outdated, things don't work properly anymore. So we need to come up with a solution moving forward that we can build a more secure version of the browser in a way that people will actually upgrade it and use it eagerly. So looking back, IE7 significantly reduced the attack surface of the browser and, and the local machine. And so we did a good job there of protecting the machine, the classic thing that bad guys wanted. Back in the mid-90s, you know, I was, I was telling Jeremiah earlier, uh, in the threat model for iframes for the first time, one of the people brought up what became clickjacking. He said, hey, you could put a button from some other site and get people to click it and they would never know. And they said, <laughs> You don't even get root from that. Why would you bother? Because back in the mid-90s, it didn't matter. The websites out there didn't have interesting content. People didn't have passwords on them that were meaningful or useful for stealing money. And so it just didn't matter. Well, IE8, times are different. You know, 2008, it's 10, 15 years. Browser's getting up there. And the attackers are getting ever more clever. There's social engineering. There's attacks against add-ons. The web application attacks are becoming alphabet soup. CSRF, click jacking, XSS, HTTP response splitting. All of these things. There's conferences, there's talks. Hey, there's a new way to do X or Y. And all of these, you know, generally there's, there's something in the browser. The browser could be doing to help mitigate this. So browsers, go drop everything and do it. And of course, the other problem is, is that, you know, basically there's no limit to the number of attackers. At the time we, uh, we wrote this originally, the, the, the generation of, next generation of attackers is coming out of grade school. You know, it was kind of tongue in cheek and it's kind of true. We actually had some guys uh, who were pen testing for the IE team who were, uh, well, let's just say they weren't legally old enough to, to be employed without having their parents fly out with them to work for, micro, to, to come out with them to Microsoft during their internships. And so basically there's lots of smart kids and the web is still so dynamic that someone who's, got unique ideas about how to combine things together, can come together and put together attacks. And then the last problem, the reason that this is the most persistent problem is, it turns out that crime does pay. And people are making significant money doing bad things to other users on the web. And that's an economic force that drives the innovation of, of the bad guys trying to attack the user. So, what's next? Well, let me just give you a quick little uh, ramp up on IE8. So IE8, we shipped our beta one for developers in March. And that was basically around getting people used to the new standards compliance work that we'd done, work in the JavaScript engine and so forth. It was pretty rough around the edges and most of the normal end users who installed it said, wow, this is pretty rough and they uninstalled it. Beta two came out in August. Pretty good reception, got millions of people using it around the world, still got some rough edges, but we're definitely moving toward the final version, the things that people will see. And so I've got a daily build on my laptop. If I do a demo later, hopefully it will be uh, nice and robust for us. Uh, but we're gonna release IE8 when it's done. And I know that that annoys a lot of people, but the reality is is that we really have to come together on the, the final set of functionality that is the proper balance for our users. And so people come to me and they say, hey, what are you doing about clickjacking? Well, clickjacking really only sort of hit the media spotlight about a month ago. In Internet Explorer 8, you know, we're pretty much done. And so people are saying, well, you can't, you can't ship unless you do something. And other people are saying, well, you've got all this goodness. Get it out there as soon as possible because we want to get our, our you know, we, we only do, want to do one migration. We want to do IE6 and we want to jump straight to IE8 right away. And so doing that balance, figuring out what the right ship date is, the right feature set, it's always very complicated. But we're close. 
And so Internet Explorer 8 is going to be available on Windows XP, Windows 2003, Vista, and it'll be the, deep, the, the, browser that sh the browser version of Internet Explorer that ships with uh, Windows 7 when Windows 7 is released. So what's our vision? You know, we looked at a lot of problems. Vision, got to figure out which direction we want to go. The direction we want to go, IE8 is the most secure browser by default. Now, in IE7, we added security feature after security feature, protected mode, ActiveX opt-in, the, uh, the extended validation certificates, international domain name lockdown. We had tons of features, things you put on the box and put a check mark, and marketing was happy because it was really easy to talk about them. And those are security features. And we've done a few security features for Internet Explorer 8, and in the slides, we'll get into what those are. The next part, though, is secure features. And this is the key thing for us, is the web platform gains in power. We have to make sure that as we add new features to enable new scenarios, that we do so securely, and we actually reduce rather than increase the attack surface of the browser. Because right now, the browsers are so complicated that if you add attack surface to them, you're soon going to end up with just a completely exploitable system where you spend all of your time issuing patches. And we've got to get out of the business of, of you know, having one-off patches every month of, oh, just found a new vulnerability and new feature X, new feature Y. And so attack surface reduction and defense in depth have been key principles throughout the Internet Explorer 8 design. And then the last thing, as I mentioned before, is finding that proper balance. If people don't upgrade, then everything we've done for security is for naught. And so we have to make sure that we're offering them compelling features that aren't security related. Five times faster JavaScript engine, standards compliant layout, new features like accelerators and web slices that get people excited about using the browser. So we've got to have a good balance. And security is an important part of that, but it's not the only part. This is the state of the world after IE7. This is the, the CVE distribution uh, report that we looked at when we were trying to figure out, OK, well, where do we focus our security dollar investments? And unfortunately, it's a little small on the screen, but the two things in red are cross-site scripting and buffer overflows. The two blue ones in the middle are uh, SQL injection attacks and PHP remote file inclusions. So basically, the first, the top three things are web server side vulnerabilities, places where web code has a vulnerability. And the, the buffer overflows, of course, is something on the browser side. So we said, OK, well, these four top pillars that tower over everything, we need an answer for these four pillars. It turns out for PHP remote file include and SQL injection, there's not a lot you can do from the browser side of things. And the reason you can't do a lot from the browser side of things is I can just telnet to your web server and attack you that way. And so it's not very interesting from the browser perspective. On the other hand, cross-site scripting. You're misusing somebody's browser to attack a web service. Hmm, you're using their browser. We own the browser. We can fix the browser. So we made investments in cross-site scripting protections for IE8. And then lastly, uh, the buffer overflows. Obviously, it's, it's been a big area of focus over time. And we've done a lot of defense in depth. And we've done yet more in Internet Explorer 8. So when we think about the investments we make, we typically, we think about, we have a high level security guarantee, the thing that we are trying to achieve in the browser, and that's nothing bad happens. And of course, it's comically just broad. It's not specific enough. So we say, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, nothing bad happens to your machine. Nothing bad happens to you, your finances, your privacy. And nothing bad happens to the web services that are used by Internet Explorer. So we broke down into browser add-on vulnerabilities, the things that we need to ensure that the other guarantees are met. You know, if there's a buffer overflow in IE that allows remote code execution, it doesn't matter about the other features because the bad guy's running code. At the same time, social engineering. We need to help protect users from themselves, from making bad decisions. And then lastly, web application vulnerabilities. We need to see what we can do to shore up defenses automatically for web applications and also provide a set of opt-in things that ensure compatibility and allow web applications to be built more securely. Starting with browser add-on vulnerabilities. This chart may be familiar, uh, maybe not. This is basically ActiveX. Everybody looks at Internet Explorer and they say, geez, get rid of ActiveX. It's terrible. It's horrible. It's the thing that's weighing you down. And to some extent, that's true. ActiveX has been a huge source of problems. The problem with getting rid of ActiveX is people don't understand what it actually means. YouTube doesn't work. OK, well, for some people, that's fine. For other people, that's a deal breaker. You know, basically, anything dependent on Flash, QuickTime, RealPlayer, Windows Media, none of these things work anymore. Right? ActiveX is an example of a plugin model. 
It was a plug-in model designed you know, back in the mid-90s, and we've done a ton of work to shore it up. ActiveX today looks nothing like it looked back then. We've added a lot of restrictions. We've made a lot of tweaks to ensure that ActiveX, the vector, is less appealing.